Good evening. It works. That's great. Hi. This is a wonderful crowd. You weren't scared away by the rain. You weren't tempted to stay home and watch NCAA basketball. <laughs> well done. We knew that the crowd for Francis Moore Le Pay would be a dedicated and large one. I invite you, if you'd like, if you're near the back and want to move up a little bit, please do. Um, there are many seats still up at the, the periphery on the, on the sides, so come up if you'd like. Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Barbara Altman, and I have uh, the great honor of being the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our eminent guest, someone who works on issues near and dear to our university and to our greater community. My remarks will be brief, so we keep as much time as possible for our guest, Francis Moore LePay, who is our 2009-2010 Cressman Lecturer in the Humanities. The Luther S. and Dorothy Cecilia Cressman Lectureship was established in 1994 with a generous bequest from former UO anthropology professor and archaeologist Luther S. Cressman, who excavated the now famous 10,000-year-old sagebrush bark sandals from a cave in central Oregon in 1938. Cressman questioned some of the received theories about the prehistoric Northwest and Great Basin and pushed forward in very important ways our understanding of the human history of this region. The lectureship's goal is, quote, the presentation and illumination of fundamental humanities issues that confront, but are too often ignored by, societies centrally occupied with science, technology, and business, end of quote. We have used this lectureship for speakers in the fields of anthropology, religion, art, and art history, natural history, and cultural studies. Among the guests who have come as Cressman lecturers are N. Scott Mamaday, pioneer of modern Native American literature, who pioneered the series as well, and Randall Robinson, the international human rights activist. Last year, we had the pleasure of hosting Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and who is also cross-appointed to the Yale Divinity School. She addressed matters of ethics, religion, and the environment. Frances Moore LePay will add even greater luster to the lectureship with her talk this evening. Even after writing or co-writing 18 books, she is still perhaps best known as the author of the vastly influential book named Diet for a Small Planet, a book that will have its 40th anniversary next year and has sold three million copies. Her most recent works include Hope's Edge, The Next Diet for a Small Planet, co-authored with her daughter, Anna LePay, in 2002. Democracy's Edge, Choosing to Save Our Country by Bringing Democracy to Life, 2006. And Getting a Grip, Two: Clarity, Creativity, and Courage for the World We Really Want, which is hot off the press just last month. And it is for sale in the lobby. <laughs> Francis LePay Moore will be signing them after the talk as well. And I have more news. We're raffling one of these, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. Getting a Grip 2 is a thorough revision of the first edition of the book by that name, Getting a Grip, which came out in 2007. And the fact that it needs a thorough revision within less than three years is a sure sign that the issues with which LePay engages are as pertinent and timely as anything going on today. I should mention, by the way, that in June 2008, both the first edition of Getting a Grip and Diet for a Small Planet were declared must-read books for the new President Obama by no less than Barbara Kingsolver and Michael Pollan, respectively. What strikes me so forcefully in LePay's work is her great ability to engage not only presidents, but also the common man and woman, all of us in fact, with the eminent good sense and feasibility of joining in what she calls, quote, a vibrant culture of mutual responsibility, end quote. Before I turn over the podium, podium to LePay, a couple of practical details. You will have found on your seats some comment sheets, a little survey that we ask you to fill out. Your feedback is very helpful to the Humanity Center in planning future events that represent our audience's interests. Please take a moment to give us some information that we ask for there. And as an incentive, I'm delighted to say that we will have a drawing, as we've done in the past, using the comment sheets as the pool of entrance. And we have a copy of this book, which Francis Moore LePay has just autographed, and that will be the prize. 
If you do want to drop that off, there are, at the moment, there are boxes in the little door bays here. There's one at the information table out in the lobby, and we will have um, OHC staff holding boxes at the main exits if you'd like to drop them on your way out. If you do want to enter the drawing, please give us just at least enough to contact you. We'll need a name and a phone number and email address, but I promise we won't abuse them. If you want a quick way out, if you're an agoraphobic and don't want to handle the crowd in the lobby, I want to tell you that there are a couple of exterior exits you can use to get out of the building. And if you do choose to stay afterwards, there is a book signing and sale in the lobby. And we will also have a question and answer session immediately following the lecture. If you wish to ask a question, please come to the mics in the, the middle aisle here, or we will bring you one. We need you to come to the mic so that your question is, um, is, uh, can be heard on the live streaming video that's going out right now and on the recording that we're making of this lecture as well. I also want, before I leave the podium, to acknowledge the work done in preparing for Francis Moore LePay's visit by the Oregon Humanities Center staff, namely Associate Director Julia Hayden, Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, Lindsay Henriksen, and Ty Bailey. Francis's visit has included meals with community and faculty members, a conversation with students, and a wonderful TV interview for UO Today that I hope you will watch when it airs a little later this spring. Now we have arrived at the main event. The lecture Francis Moore LePay is about to present is entitled Getting a Grip, Gaining Clarity, Creativity, and Courage for the World We Really Want. Please join me in welcoming her. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I uh, have to thank Barbara, of course, and Julia. I have been doing this for a while, you know, traipsing around and giving talks, and I can honestly say I've never felt more welcome, never felt more at home, and learned so much in a day as I have from the conversations with the people here. And so I um, am even more proud to say that I'm a native Oregonian. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, thank you so very much. Um, I would like to make our night together very real, not just some author lady talking to you. So I, I'd like to ask you to cooperate with me in the realness creation by uh, just turning to the closest person next to you to who you don't know and introducing yourself and just giving them a little tidbit of like what your major is or what you do or thing you love, whatever it is. Uh, would you do that for me? Just <laughs> warm it up a little bit in here. <laughs> thank you very much for... Thank you. You are really... Uh, <laughs> this is easy. <laughs> And now I have a few questions for you. I have three questions before I get underway. So how many of you are really worried about our planet? How many of you are really worried about your personal path on this planet? And how many of you feel that you have, if not a working hypothesis, some pretty strong hunch about why we're in the mess we're in. <laughs> oh, that's so great. OK, well, you got to push back, because tonight is my, I've got the mic, right, somewhere here. So you're going to hear my personal hypothesis about why we're in the mess we're in. Because I believe that if we don't have one of those things, if we don't have a strong sense of causation, and therefore how to reverse the negative forces, then we really are vulnerable to despair, of which is the greatest luxury we cannot afford right now. And as I say that, I think of the words of, of D. Hawk, the guy who founded Visa. He said, <clears throat> it is far too late, and things are far too bad for pessimism. 
And so that's sort of the refrain of the night. It's way too late for that. So here's the question. You know, I started out, as many of you know, asking why hunger in the world, and then why hunger in a world of plenty, and then my question kept growing and growing until it is, how do we make sense of the fact that we are creating as societies a world that as individuals we would never choose, not one of us, because nobody anywhere gets up in the morning and says, yeah, yeah, today I'm going to make sure another child dies of hunger. And yet today, maybe 25,000 have. And nobody gets up and says, yeah, how can I help heat up this planet and decimate more species? So we have to have a working hypothesis of how, we is, how it is that we are creating a world that we as individuals abhor. It sounds on the surface pretty mysterious. And so I asked just to eliminate a few things then, is it that we don't know how, that human beings just haven't figured out how to end poverty or not heat our planet. And clearly, um, if you think of, say, food, oh, we don't know how, wait a minute, uh, we know how to produce more than enough food to make us all chubby. <laughs> Even on the leftovers, <laughs> as I like to put it, what's left over after we feed a third of the world's grain to livestock, 90, 80 to 90% of the world's soy, to livestock, and now a third of the world's catch to livestock. There's still enough. So we know how to do that. And uh, what about poverty? We don't know how to end poverty? How can we say that? In this country, in the 1960s, we cut the poverty rate in half. And even in a country like India, the poor southern state of Kerala, with, that lives on 5% of the US per capita income, they have longevity rates there that are almost equal to the industrial countries, a, a, a measure, at least, of moving toward and into poverty that stunts life. So I don't think we can say that we don't know how to do that. Well, what about um, heating the planet? We just don't have an, well, let me just ask it another way. Is it that we are creating this world we don't want because there just isn't enough, there's not enough Food, no, I've already said there's plenty of food. There's not enough energy that doesn't heat the planet. No, 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 no. We know that now the sun provides the earth daily 15,000 times a dose of energy that we're currently using as fossil fuels. So clearly, just in just these tastes, we, we have the know-how, we have the resources. Then what is it? Is it human nature? Is it just that human nature is so selfish and materialistic and, and competitive that we just can't do it? We can't come together to, to manifest what we know? Is that it? Is it our nature? Well, look again, because I, I love looking at uh, the new anthropology and the new neuroscience that is documenting what we experience every day, <laughs> right? That actually, if, if you really look at, 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 at us, we, we have evolved with profoundly pro-social qualities. I, I think of them, first of all, as empathy, that we're learning that we actually have neurons in our brains that fire when we observe each other so that our empathy is actually hardwired in our brains, that we actually experience what we observe in others, to the point that, that um, even, even other species, like rhesus monkeys, it turns out, that they will go for days without eating, if by eating it means that they have to, to uh, send an electric shock that might hurt another monkey. One, would, one went for up to 12 days without eating. So it's not just hum, uh, uh, human beings, but even other primates. Innate empathy. So we've got that going for us. And what about our joy and cooperation? I was taken by the study at, um, Emory University in Atlanta, where they looked at our brains when we were competing and when we were cooperating, and they found that when human beings cooperate, that there are parts of our brains that are stimulated the same as when we eat chocolate. <laughs> really, that's how great it is to cooperate. And we also have a very, very deeply carved need for fairness. With justice, when you think about it, we evolved over 90 percent of our evolution in tightly knit tribes where we knew that unfairness would just tear things apart and that, and that our own survival depended on things staying together. And so we have a very deeply carved 
need for justice and fairness. In fact, in other psychological studies done, that it turns out that we will, t in, 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 when these experiments are set up so that we, we can choose to take nothing for ourselves or take something that we consider unfair, that the other guy gets away with something unfair, we'd rather get nothing than let somebody get away with unfairness. And again, it's not just our species. Cabbage and monkeys have a great sense of fairness. When they see another monkey getting a, a raisin or a grape and they're only getting a cucumber, they will throw back that ration to their caretaker until they get a fair deal. So these are very deeply, deeply carved in us. And on, that, on the need for justice, I'm struck by the words of Adam Smith, you know, who supposedly was the godfather of greed. Well, Adam Smith understood. You remember the, the, the um, philosopher who wrote The Wealth of Nations, but also The Theory of Moral Sentiments? And he understood this deep need for, for justice. And he said, quote, we, we, that other social sentiments may be optional, but the need for, he said, we are in some peculiar manner tied, tied, bound, and obliged to the observation of justice because of this understanding that our preservation, our individual preservation depended on the tribe's preservation, and justice is what held us together. And equally important, as I've mentioned cooperation and, and, um, and empathy and fairness, equally important, we humans can count on the fact that we are doers. How could we have gotten to 6.8 billion if we weren't fundamentally doers? We could never have gotten here if we were essentially couch potatoes and whiners. No. So if you ask, why are we creating this world that none of us individually would choose? I think you have to acknowledge that actually we can't really blame human nature if we have all of these incredibly positive qualities. So what is it? <laughs> And over the years, I've, I've asked this question and gotten many, many, uh, much help from many, many people. And, um, but one in particular, whose name many of you of my generation will remember, the name Eric Fromm, right? Who wrote The Art of Loving. And I remember that at age 16. But much later in life, I read a book of his that is not very widely read. It's called The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness. Do you know that book? Some people do. It's unusual. Um, he writes in it one sentence. He says, it is man's humanity that makes him so inhuman. That sentence changed my life because I realized in his explanation that what he is getting at helps me solve a mystery. He says that it is the unique capacity, human our species, our unique capacity is that we see the world through what he called frames of orientation. We are creatures of the mind. There is no unfiltered reality for Homo sapiens. We see the world through what my daughter and I write in Hope's Edge. We call it our mental map. That basically we can't see what is outside of that frame. That is what he means when he says it is our humanity that makes us so inhuman. Because this, this quality in us, this fact that we are creatures of the mind, that's all well and good. There's nothing wrong with that. If, 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 if we are alive at a time when we are absorbing, absorbing frames that are fundamentally life-giving, that are fundamentally aligned with our own nature and with the rest of nature. But my thesis tonight is that you and I happen to be alive in this moment when the dominant mental mass that we absorb daily and is now going global is fundamentally life-destroying. It is life-destroying because it is mal-aligned, not just misaligned, mal-aligned with human nature and with wider nature. And so the challenge then is to make this turn toward life by stepping up in my new book, uh, Getting a Grip, it's, the first chapter is called A Species Grows Up. And what this means for me is now we have the knowledge to look very, very much at the evidence of what is human nature and what is the nature of nature and align then our social choices with that. But let me just describe then the dominant map that I believe 
has us creating this world that we as individuals abhor. I'm gonna keep taking sips of this because I do have a little tickle in my throat that I don't want to take over. Mm. Thank you for the tea, Barbara. So I'm going to try just very, very briefly, um, and it, it's a spiral inside the cover of Getting a Grip, very briefly to describe what is the dominant mental map that my hypothesis is that's taking us down, down, down. The dominant mental map starts with the premise of lack, not enoughness, scarcity, scarcity of everything, but I call it the scarcity of goods and goodness. There's not enough stuff in the world, whether it's food or energy or parking places in Boston where I try to park. There's not enough of anything, and there's not enough goodness in us. The dominant mental map is that we are what? We are just selfish little shoppers. We are simply competitive and materialistic and, and, um, and uh, very much uh, self-centered. So if there's not enough goods and goodness, the dominant mental map tells us that we are Inevitably, we have to turn over our fate to others because we just simply can't do it ourselves. We are too flawed. We lack too much. And we have to look to others to sort out this competitive struggle. We have to look to authority somewhere. Or better yet, better yet, we find an automatic force, a magical force. Ronald Reagan named it the magic of the market. Yes, a force that will, by its infallible laws, sort out outcomes for us because we ourselves are too flawed. Now, unfortunately, our notion of this infallible magical market got hooked on this peculiar idea that a market economy, because market exchanges, of course, have worked for human beings for eons, but we got this wacky notion that a market driven by one rule that is highest return to those who already have wealth, mm -hmm. people who own the shares, and run the companies, that an economy driven by highest return to existing wealth will create benign outcomes for everybody. But instead, what does it do? It does what we all should have learned playing Monopoly, <laughs> right? Actually, Monopoly was invented by a Quaker lady who wanted to, in the early 1900s, who wanted to teach us what would happen, and we didn't pay any attention. <laughs> but in my household, what happened? is by the end of the night, my brother had all the property and I couldn't even afford Baltic Avenue. <laughs> and that's the world we live in. Think about it. We are playing Monopoly when we could be living democracy. But we've got hooked into this giant game of Monopoly that I love it, that now I don't have to name it. Citigroup named it. Citigroup named it in 2005. And they call it a plutonomy. We live in a plutonomy, folks. And in a plutonomy, they advise their Clients, you better get on the gravy train and invest in, in toys for the wealthy. Because we now live in an economy, they said, in which 1% of households control as much wealth as 90% of the rest of us. So here we are. Now, it would be bad enough if I stopped there, but it keeps going. Because the spiral of what I call the spiral of powerlessness that starts with the premise of scarcity, then ends up with such concentration of wealth that it then infuses and infects, infuses and infects our political system so that we end up now with <clears throat> over two dozen lobbyists in Washington for every single person that you and I elect to represent us there. We end up with what Franklin Delano Roosevelt, well, many great leaders have warned us against, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt said it most purely and eloquently when he addressed a joint session of Congress in 1938. And he said, quote, the liberty of democracy is not safe. If a people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself, that in its essence is fascism. Now, I have to admit to you tonight and there's a lot about courage at the end of my talk, but I haven't yet found the courage to use the F word without quoting an American president. <laughs> but I'm working on it. <laughs> and I heard a few of you resonate with me, so maybe that'll give me more backbone and I can even use that word without quoting FDR. But the point is then that we end up, what happens then is that we end up then, this spiral of powerlessness ends up then with, um, with 
um, this sense that things that, that reinforces itself because of course as scarcity increases of course as let me put it this way as the top 1% control more wealth than the bottom 90% then a lot of people really do experience real scarcity right one half think of this one half of american children will live on food stamps at some point in their childhood one half that's in a country that produces almost a quarter of world economic output. So we create the experience of scarcity, which then convinces us even further that we're all just trapped in the scarcity scare and our sense of powerlessness and fear magnifies. So here we are. Now, the, the, um, the challenge then is that uh, we, end up, we end up then with the real lack, I've said that the lack of goods and goodness is a myth, that actually, and I will come to this in a moment, that the more accurate picture that is aligned with our nature is a spiral of possibility that is a spiral of empowerment. But I want to stay with lack for a minute because this myth of the lack, that is the lack of good and goodness at the center of the spiral of powerlessness, actually <laughs> ends up in a real lack and that is the lack of a concept of democracy that is vital and strong enough to meet today's needs. That we end up with an understanding of democracy as simply elections plus a market economy, which we've proven now cannot work. India has elections and a market economy, and half the children are stunted by malnutrition. So what we end up with is what new, uh, sci um, uh, linguists call hypocognition, the lack of a concept we need to thrive. And so I want to then start to move to the positive part of this talk. And that is that um, we can move out of the spiral of powerlessness if we get a real grip on what is human nature and the nature of nature. So I want to just stay there for a minute and then talk about what it would look like to have a, a you know, because I believe we create the world according to the ideas that we hold. What would be an idea of democracy that we, could, that we could believe so that we could see and birth? But let me just go back to human nature. I've talked about the good parts in us, the very, very now, uh, more and more proven by neuroscience and the new anthropology that talks about how we evolved in tightly knit tribes, raising our babies together, and so we bonded so deeply with one another and all of that. And though, to make this turn toward life, we also have to recognize that not just a few of us, but most of us, most of us in certain conditions will also behave with unspeakable cruelty. So we have to, we have to embrace the whole, the good, bad, and the really ugly about all of us. And I just want to mention, just before I get to the good parts, I just want to mention just a couple of examples that have so struck me. Many of you are, for example, aware, I'm sure, of the infamous prison experiment in Stanford in 1971. Any of you know of this? This is Philip Zimbardo, who just finally was able to write the his book these decades later about what happened in that experiment. He chose, he chose young people. He tested normal. He tested them normal, and he put them in a mock prison setting divided between guards and prisoners. The experiment was supposed to last for two weeks. But Philip Zimbardo had to stop his experiment within six days because the guards were so brutally abusing the prisoners that there were nervous breakdowns among the prisoners. Actually, he said <coughs> that he stopped the experiment because his girlfriend told him that he had become the warden. And he started behaving not as a scientist looking out for the interest of his subjects, but as the warden of this prison. And he then testified in the Abu Ghraib hearing, talking about what are the conditions that normal people will behave in such incredibly <coughs> evil ways. Or I think of another thing that moved me is the book Battalion 101, where it tells a story of 500 reservists in Poland in the 1940s. 500 reservists who had never really been trained uh, particularly to be killers at all. 500 men over a very short period of time killed point blank 38,000 Jews and sent over 40,000 off to Treblinka. 
ordinary men who at first were repelled and disgusted, but by the end, 90% of them participated in the slaughter. So what I think that, that we've got to get our heads around is both these profoundly pro-social qualities and recognize that it's not just the evil other. It's not just the Osama bin Laden or George Bush. It's not just the people <laughs> that, we, that we don't like. No, if we really recognize that it is, we are all capable, and we don't know if we're really capable of that level of evil until we're tested. So we have to assume that we are. So if we get that clear, it seems to me that, it's, that our path gets a lot sharper. How do we get out of this downward spiral? It's by what? It's by looking at what are the conditions then that bring out the best in us and what are the conditions that keep the worst of us in check. And I'm sure many of you will have answers to that, but I'll just say that three really strike me as pretty obvious that bring out the worst and the opposite of them bring out the best in us. And those are, one, the concentration of power. Two, anonymity, secrecy, non-transparency. Think of what happened on Wall Street. Those, the people who were doing all that, those, those fancy instruments and the credit default swaps and all those derivatives based on shaky real estate market, you know what their slogan was? It was, IBG, YBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. They knew that what they were doing was probably going to collapse, but they'd be out of there. It was anonymity. That doesn't work with human beings. So concentration of power, anonymity, and third is othering of scapegoating, as we see today with Glenn Beck and, and Limbaugh with, with the just scapegoating, scapegoating. It's, it's them, it's them, it's them. And even people I know, oh, it's the Tea Partiers, you know, it's, it's the other. So those three conditions, we're pretty certain now, bring out the worst in human beings, so it seems like we kind of know what to do. <laughs> We flip them. We dissolve each of those conditions. And so the rest of my talk, I want to quickly, I want to quickly talk about how then we create this spiral of possibility. We create the spiral of possibility with starting with the premise that there is enough both goods and goodness and that we can now decipher what are these conditions. And we can then look. You see, I think we, we hear the expression, um, um, seeing is believing, but I think believing is seeing. And we have to believe in the possibility of the new in order to see it. And so I want to, in the rest of my minutes with you, I want to just share with you then how I see people actually stepping up and dissolving each of these negative conditions and creating the flip. In other words, the flip of number one is the dispersion of power so that we're all not just dividing up a pie of power, but actually co-creating new power? Or how are we dissolving anonymity by creating face-to-face -face communities in which we are known and accountable? And third, how do we stop the blame game and step up to recognize our mutual accountability? I mean, even Wall Street, for example. It's so easy for me, as many, I'm sure, to get so angry about what went on on Wall Street that created global massive increase in global hunger and dislocation and suffering and uh, countless misery. And yet, we also have to take responsibility because we let it happen. In some way, we condone the pulling away of the kind of regulation and transparency that would have prevented that from happening. So I think that, that, um, that what excites me and what keeps me going then is this sense that um, we can see our way through now to a different way of thinking of democracy itself. No longer this failed idea of democracy as something done to us or for us, the notion that we can just co uh, trust concentrated power and trust the magic of the market. And rather, democracy not as a set system that's finished and done that we inherited, but democracy as a set of values, a set of values that permeate every aspect of our lives together. So that these values show up in education, they show up in the economy, they show up in politics, they show up in cultural life. Values, what values? The values of mutual accountability, the values of fairness, uh, the values of inclusion, 
And, and I believe, and what gets me up in the morning, as I say, is that I see this, they may not call it living democracy, but I see it emerging in all over the world. And I just want to bring a couple of examples here from our own country I, I, um, and, and from abroad as well. So I just want to start with economic life because I think that's the hardest for people to imagine. What would a democratic economy look like, especially now that the S word is a new curse word? Um, so I prefer, and I've always preferred, to talk about a democratic economy. What does that look like at the level of the enterprise, at the level of the economy? Well, I was struck uh, recently looking at, at uh, a democratic enterprise understood, as all, many, all of you certainly know, is the structure of a cooperative, where it's not a one person, um, it's, it is a one person, one vote, not a one share, one vote. And I realized that rather than being marginal, as most of us think of, oh, cooperatives, they're nice, but they're kind of marginal, actually, I estimate that about as many people in the world are members of cooperatives than own shares in publicly traded companies. And does that surprise you? Because it really did surprise me. But then I look at a country like India, for example, and again, the media tells us what the dominant image of the world is. What do we hear about the high-tech boom in India? But actually, village level, women creating dairy co-ops in India there are now about over 13 million women involved in creating 100, over 100,000 dairy co-ops that create a fifth of the milk production in India and made India a major milk producer. All cooperatives that have created about six times, I calculate, six times more jobs than the entire high-tech industry, right? And it's all based on this cooperative model. And of course, then I jump to the United States and I think, oh, dairy co-op. What is that? What bell does that ring? And then I go back to sitting. I, this is a story on me, ye a little faith, where I was sitting in a pew in western Wisconsin, Viroqua, uh, Wisconsin, in 1988, and I met this handful of farmers who were desperate because their friends were going out of business. Some had committed suicide. And they said, you know, we want to start an organic dairy co-op. Do you know where this is going? Yeah. So I said, oh, that's nice, that's nice. That'll help a few people in western Wisconsin, and that's great. And here we are in the year 2010, and now 1,400 farmers and a half a billion dollar business, and you know the label Organic Valley. So I'm saying that this is a vision of a market, yes, but driven by principles that are more democratic than a single owner in control that we think of as essential to a market economy. I think of the region of Emilia-Romagna in Italy where a third of the economy is produced by not large co-ops, but, but co-ops of around 50 members or so, and Emilia-Romagna is one of the wealthiest regions in all of, all of Europe. So at the level of the enterprise, but also at the level of the econo of the level of our communities, and I talk to many people here who are part of not just uh, creating new uh, farmers markets and uh, new uh, school to farm programs and that sort of thing, but I would call it a local living economy, part of democracy, not a separate thing, but this is thinking of democracy as a way of life. And the movement for local living economies, remembering that small family-owned businesses still produce half the jobs in this country, that this is now a network of, of I believe, a couple hundred cities. And I'm going to Bellingham uh, this week to speak there at the city that is perhaps best known for its creating a consciousness of local first. And so now in that, in that town of Bellingham, 60% of the residents through the initiatives of the store owners coming together and, and showing people the value of buying locally where the, the, the wealth can circulate and stay in the community, uh, they 60% now prefer to shop in these stores, these buy local, think local first movement is, is, is very real in this country. So there's the level of enterprise, the level of the community, and then of course the level of government itself. What does, what does living democracy look like as it applies to 
our economic life. Well, certainly, uh, one obvious dimension, if we're talking about living democracy working as it disperses power and prevents the, the concentration of power that we know brings out the worst in us, we see it now finally in the Obama administration beginning to step up to the monopoly power in agribusiness, for example, with Monsanto. I don't know if you've been reading these stories, but Monsanto um, controls now germplasm in 80 to 90% uh, of the seeds in corn and soy. And as a result of that monopoly power, that the prices for these seeds have grown at four to over six times the consumer price index since 2001. So part of living democracy is accepting, of course, that government is there to create the values boundaries within which the market works. And one of those boundaries is to prevent monopoly so that we can actually have a fair and free market. And in fact, on that note, I would like us to redefine free market as the freedom to participate in the market. <laughs> That's the real free market. So, and part, of course, of a living democracy, it relates to economic life and government, is government stepping up to create the legislative framework that then draws people into being producers instead of just consumers, say, of energy. And the most remarkable example of this was birthed, I think, in Germany. And I call it, it uh, because it has a funny name in, when it's translated from the German, I call it reward renewables laws. Basically laws that say if you are a householder and you produce any form of clean energy, that you will be, re you will be compensated for that at a rate that will give you a very good return for your investment over a 20 year period. So of course, householders all over Germany are stepping up in this one of the fastest rates of movement toward renewable energy, I believe now well over 15% of uh, energy, of electricity in, um, in Germany is produced by these renewable sources, dispersed so that they're much safer uh, from every dimension you think of safety, and that's coming to the United States. Um, Fort Lauderdale, I believe, Florida just passed a unanimous vote, a reward renewables law that uh, is, is working beautifully there because people see that, yes, part of democracy is making the market work in a way that serves us all. Um, I'm also seeing um, uh, living democracy emerging very much in cultural life, which includes, I believe, education of our kids. So that, to me, living democracy is emerging when I see what is, I love, uh, in Maine, they call it apprentice citizenship. Instead of just service learning, which always has a bit of do for in it for me, they call it apprentice citizenship. So youngsters, very young kids, are out in the community addressing environmental problems and, and public safety problems. And I'll never forget this little kid I interviewed. And he said, think about it. He was involved in a, a public safety thing where he was teaching little kids to wear their helmets. He said, think about it. I might be saving lives. How cool is that? <laughs> and you know, his teacher said, you know, I couldn't get Kevin to write anything, but when it came to writing an essay about what he was doing with these younger kids, he was on fire about it. So that sense of being useful, being purposeful, uh, giving kids that chance for power very early in life. And I think about also a movement. Have you ever heard of Youth Build? Do you know Youth Build? Well, Youth Build was started by a friend of mine named Dorothy Stoneman in uh, the late in, the, in, in uh, Harlem in the late 70s. And now, uh, 92,000 kids who had dropped out of school, who had no, had no future, they have been brought into, it's so common sense, it's brought into an empowerment model in which young people can get their GED, can learn a building trade, and can rehab, often for homeless people, rehab a housing unit, and learn the skills of living democracy. They get to elect, they get to help choose staff. They're part of the fundraising approach. And these young people are, their lives are transformed. They have now rehabbed, I believe it is um, 19,000 units and now are spreading throughout the United States. The Obama administration has put more funding into this, 273 sites across the country. I think of this cultural transition to living democracy in the form of time dollars. Do you know about time dollars? Where communities can, where everybody's time is equal and there's a neat computer program you can go to at timedollars.org. And you can, you can say if you are a good seamstress and, and somebody else is a good tax preparer, 
uh, hey, you can get your clothes altered and they can get there. It's such a community building and it's all, we all are equal. The lawyer's hours is the same as the babysitter's hours in terms of value. Um, and then I think also of the emergence and, and living democracy, new approaches to decision making that go way beyond just voting or just having sort of loose discussion and a hand raise. Because over the last 20 years or so, and one of the leaders of this movement is here in your community named Tom Attlee. Tom, are you here? There he is, I thought I recognized you. Um, but Tom Attlee is a very old friend of mine and, and who's inspired me in my, all of my work on living democracy. But he is a leader, uh, a trailblazer really, in an international movement that is developing everything from what are called citizen juries, such as worked in Mali, where farmers of all sizes came together and uh, talked and talked and talked about whether they really wanted GMO cotton in Mali. And after hearing from what was going on in other countries, including from India, where people were totally wiped out, who had taken in, who had been taken in on the GMO cotton route, uh, that they decided as a group, no, they did not want their government to allow GM cotton into their, into their country. The citizen's jury also, uh, and then there is another technique called um, the deliberative poll, which believe it or not, having grown up in Texas, yes, I was born here, but I grew up in Texas, uh, unfortunately for me, but uh, in, in Texas, that uh, the utilities there use the deliberative poll, which is a, a variant of this process of uh, group decision making that actually uh, allowed citizens to weigh in about what they wanted in terms of um, uh, what they wanted in terms of energy sources and renewables versus non-renewables, et cetera, et cetera. And those deliberative polls are one of the reasons that Texas, even under George Bush, began as, as governor, uh, began to move toward being a leader as it is now in wind energy. And most recently in uh, Michigan, people were brought together where they were chosen randomly, scientific random sampling of people, brought together and uh, given a lot of information about the economic downturn in and terrible situation in Michigan and then asked to come up with solutions. At the end of a weekend of a deep deliberation, they together, the, the majority of them, the vast majority of them said that they wanted to increase their own income taxes to help turn their state around. That is what can happen. Just think if President Obama, instead of we getting last summer to those town hall tirades, what if, what if we had together, if he had invited us into such a conversation? That's such a conversation meaning that you know, with background material we can read about and being welcomed into our libraries and our church basements to really talk with one another and then had a place where our views could be registered by the federal government all transparent about what we wanted in health care, in health insurance reform. Just think what a different place we might be today than we are in this still divisive debate. So this technology of deliberation is uh, greatly, greatly increasing. Um, so then we get to what does living democracy look like when it comes to politics? Imagine that, a real democracy as it relates to politics. And quite frankly, when I, when I kind of get close to this part of what I'm trying to describe, I, I begin to fear about the eyes glazing over because I think so many Americans feel so distant that we've had the best democracy money can buy for so long that it really is hard to imagine something different. And so I just want to emphasize uh, that right now we know how to do this. We know how to get money out and get ourselves into public decision making. Right now, I know, uh, I know it sounds like the ultimate oxymoron, but I really think we've ended up with what can only be called privately held government. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a way to get our democracy to, for us again. And it's working in three states. We don't have to invent the wheel here. In three states, and one of them is Maine. And I just want to tell you, it's called voluntary public financing. Some call it fair elections, some call it clean elections. But in Maine, listen to just one person's story. In the year 2000, Deb Simpson, my superhero, was a waitress and a single mom with a high school education. 
But her friends saw a lot of leadership in Deb. And they said, Deb, why don't you run for the state legislature? And she looked at them kind of like, what are you talking about? Because I don't have money, I don't have a name. And they said, no, Deb, you're not paying attention. We have clean elections in Maine. All you have to do is get five bucks from 50 people and you can run. And she said, oh, I'm a waitress. Maybe I could do that. And she ran. She's been reelected four times. And she is now so esteemed by her colleagues that she was, uh, she served on the state um, judiciary committee and so esteemed by her colleagues in other states that she was appointed to a commission, a national commission to deal with nuclear waste. That's how much this diner waitress has traveled because she had the opportunity, because she was able to run without being dependent on corporate funds. And the state of Maine then was able, because 80% of the people in Maine who were in the legislature have run without corporate money, they were able to pass the first producer responsibility law in this country. The first producer responsibility law in electronics that required electronics corporations to be responsible for the full life cycle of what they produced. And that, in a couple years, has kept one pound of lead for every resident in Maine out of the waste stream. And this is a law that was fought like crazy by every electronics company except Hewlett Packard because they do have a recycling uh, capacity. It was fought, fought, fought by corporations, but it was passed because the legislature could listen to what the people wanted. So right now, in Congress, House and Senate, there is a law, there is a bill, Fair Elections Now Act, Fair Elections Now Act. In the House, it has bipartisan support, it has over 100 co-sponsors, and it will establish at, for Congress the same approach that you, you, if you want to run for Congress, you get a certain number of contributors up to and no more than $100, and you prove yourself viable, and then you can only raise money from individuals up to $100, but then you get fourfold that from public funds, so that you do not have to depend on corporations. So I'm suggesting then that all of these dimensions are what it will take to move us from the spiral of powerlessness to a spiral of empowerment, moving away from the conditions that we know now that history shows, anthropology, even lab experiments on us show to bring out the worst in us, to those of dispersed power, of real community, not um, anonymity, but real community, and mutual accountability instead of the blame game. And that these are all ways, all tastes of this global growing up as a species that I think is possible. But I will close with just one more piece to this message because I do think there's another critical piece. And that has to do with something very, very personal, even more personal than what I've talked about and with our evolutionary heritage. Because you're not going to be surprised now when I say I think we're good enough, we're plenty good enough. But there is something still kind of missing <laughs> in our basic construct, but we can do something about it. And that something missing comes down from this, that we evolved in such tightly knit tribes, we were so bound to one another, that the scariest thing of all is breaking with the pack breaking with the tribe. But here we are, 2010, and the whole tribe is heading over Victoria Falls. <laughs> so breaking from the pack has a whole different meaning in the 21st century. Instead of death, it means life. Breaking with the pack is life. But we're still hardwired. And so breaking with the pack can still bring up fear. Can still bring up fear. So part of the reframe and fear, I'm convinced also, is in part an idea. We have the idea about fear that it means we have, to, we have only three responses, right? Fight, flee, or um, fight. freeze, right, fight, fear. Freeze is the most common one, I think, actually. So the, that's, we think those are the only responses. But I'm convinced that there's a bigger repertoire. And if we understand that fear is natural, if we are really stepping up, to align ourselves 
and to align with all we know about how nature works, then we will recognize that we will be experiencing fear. And we can reframe it, not as a burden, as we thought it was, oh, you're in the wrong place, you're in the wrong time, get out of there or freeze so you won't be seen. But it may well be just information. When we feel, in my case, it's the pounding heart. It's definitely the pounding heart. And so I have a cheesy trick when in the reframe category. So when I feel that when I'm really on the edge and I'm really scared and I feel the pounding heart, I say, oh, it's just inner applause. <laughs> And that's a whole lot better than it used to be, which is you wimp. So I'm saying that if we're going to make this turn, we have to rethink fear. And so I call what's required uh, is bold humility, that we've got to get this boldness by reframing fear, by encouraging each other to take the risks that are going to bring up fear. And the bold humility, the humility piece is this. And this gets so much easier the older you get. I love getting old for this reason, among others. Um, but one of them is that I realize that the things that most get me out of bed in the morning, like for example, oh my goodness, when I was, well, let me just complete the sentence and I'll go back to that. Um, <laughs> the things that most get me up in the morning, I would never have given more than a 1% chance of success when I was, you know, my children's age or in my 20s, they're in their 30s now, but you know, when I was young. I wouldn't, I mean, think about it. Land reform in Brazil? Are you kidding? Every time there's been land reform, the, the peasants have been wiped out. And yet, Brazil has probably the largest social movement in our hemisphere that is creating a, a, a third of a million people on 20 million acres of land, creating new organic farms and schools and businesses. I wouldn't have gotten, given it much of a chance at all. Or, or what about the planting of billions of, uh, you know, billions of trees? No, no, no. And yet, listen to this. Are you aware that the UNEP, the Environmental Program, set a goal a few years ago of a global movement called Plant for the Planet? Are you aware of this? Plant for the Planet had the goal of, I believe it started out at four billion trees. And last year, they were, they were so so far ahead that they had to up the number to seven billion trees. And then, before this trip, I went back because for, anyway, back to the website, and there are now 10 billion trees that have been planted all over the globe through this Plant for the Planet movement that most of us had never heard about. I only heard about it because I was in Germany in a school where they were planning for the planet in Germany. So, uh, you know, it's not possible to know what's possible. That's the humility part. That's the humility part. And that is what, and I will just, on that note of it's not possible to know what's possible, I'll just end with one more story and then a very short part of a poem. My story, I want to take you to Brazil because this is a story that kind of weaves together everything that I've said tonight. And my daughter and I went there in the year um, 2000. We went there because the city government of the fourth largest city in Brazil had run on the platform of food as a human right. And we wanted to go and see what it looked like to be in a city where food was a human right. And we got to the city and we realized as we talked to the coordinator of what was going on there, that it wasn't like, oh yeah, food is a right, so therefore we're gonna make the soup lines longer and give, have more food give out. They, in a very living democracy motif, they brought together small farmers and large farmers and institutions, universities, hospitals, and citizen organizations and religious organizations, and they came up with literally dozens, dozens of schemes to make the market honest, to make the market free, as I said, free so that we could all participate in it. For example, they had small plots of city-owned land that were unused. And they said to the local organic farmers, hey, come use this plot of land if, if, if you will keep the price of food in the reach of the poorest people. They, keeping the, 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 the marketplaces and the supermarkets honest, they posted in bus stops and announced on the radio, where are the cheapest of the 45 food commodities, where can you find the cheapest? So there couldn't be the kind of price gouging that you get in this country where the poorest <laughs> paid the most for food and on and on and on. And so 
at the end of um, at the end of, of, of our visit there, our jaws were dropping at what we were witnessing. And so, of course, I wanted to follow this story after I got home. So this last year, I went back and I said, OK, what happened in Bella Horizonte as the result of food as a human right? And this engaged approach of mutual accountability, everybody stepping up and coordinating these efforts. And I learned, and I learned that in 10 years, the city had reduced child death by 60% in 10 years, and they had done it with one penny per resident per, per day, one penny per resident per day. And I flashed back, I flashed back to that last hour we spent with Adriana Aranja, who was the coordinator who now is spreading this approach throughout Brazil. And I said to her, Adriana, do you know how out of step you are? You know, the world is on this, this track saying the market can do no harm and government can do no good. And you're saying, actually, the government, the city government is working together with the market? Do you realize <laughs> you know, this is really risky when you started this? What were you thinking? So she went off in Portuguese, of which I, didn't under I don't understand a word. And I tried to be really respectful and not interrupt. But at one point, she started to tear up. And at that point, I interrupted her. I interrupted the, I said to the interpreter, you've got to tell, you've got to interrupt and find out why Adriana is tearing up. And so he did. And it turned out that at that point she said, yes, she said, yes, Francis. She said, I knew how out of step we were, and I knew how much hunger there is in the world. What I didn't know, and what makes, upsets me so, is how easy it is to end it. And as I think of those words, it's very clear to me, she didn't mean easy in any simple way. She meant that if you shift, if we are able to shift our frame of possibility and to really say, okay, it's not possible to know what's possible and to choose food as a right of citizenship and then to see that we can work together to realize that through democratic accountability, we can create a market that serves us, that is truly free as so defined of our participation, that it is in that sense easy. So uh, I would like then to end with the words of a poet I admire greatly who says everything I've been trying to say to you tonight, but in much more beautiful language and much shorter. The poem is by Denise Levertov. It's called Beginners. We have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can we tire of hope? So much is in bud. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. We have only begun to envision how it might be to live as siblings with beast and flower, no longer as oppressor. We have only begun to know the power that is ours if we would join our solitudes in a communion of struggle. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture. So much is in bud. Thank you. Thank you. so very, very much. Uh, the older I get, the harder it is to give speeches <laughs> because there's so much I want to share with you. And so it just means so much to me to receive you and to be here and just being treated with such generosity and kindness from the moment I got off the airplane. So thank you. And Barbara's going to help me because um, choose because I, I have a hard time thinking of who should go next. And if you would help Barbara. Um, oh, but oh, people are going to walk up, so maybe I, I can do we this. We have a request <laughs> that you will use the podium mic um, oh. for the quality of okay. the response. Okay. So we'll ask you again if you'd like to ask a question to come to the mics in the middle of the aisle so that we can capture your question on our recording and on the streaming video. 
And as we've been doing um, at recent Humanity Center events, we would ask that you do indeed ask a question <laughs> and that you limit your intervention to um, a minute or a minute and a half so that we can assure as much participation as possible. Thank you. I'll just step aside and I'll help run traffic if we need it. Okay, sorry, I've forgotten the setup here. Thank you. Welcome, thank you. Uh, I'd like to be interested in hearing your comments on two topics, uh, population, and the other one with regards to corporations uh, living endlessly, you might say. Thank you, two extremely important questions. Population first. Um, I wrote a little book in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the 1980s called Taking Population Seriously. You, you asked the question, right? Um, taking Population Seriously, in which I laid out um, the frame that rapid population growth, unsustainable population growth, is a symptom of exactly the powerlessness that is also the root of hunger and so much other misery. And that we can only bring population into balance with the regenerative powers of nature itself as we address the the concentration of power that is embedded in so many of the cultural frames that, such as I described tonight here. So um, that, that is the overall approach that is not an independent variable, it is a dependent variable. And, and I think attempts, uh, notwithstanding that yes, absolutely, uh, there's been, as you probably know, a great drop off in help for family planning for around the world, which is a great human tragedy um, because so many births are, un something about 40%, I believe, of births are unintended, um, you know, unintended pregnancies. And as we fall off uh, our obligation, I think, to help to spread the capacity for people to choose uh, the size of their families, that that is a great, great setback for human freedom uh, and human dignity. But I think that we can only really bring population into balance as we create these, uh, what I would call living democracy policies and cultures. Um, as far as the corporation, the, uh, I, I decided not to get into that, so I'm glad you asked, because I do believe ultimately, and many people you probably know, those who are working on um, to challenge the presumption that kind of grew over time through precedent um, uh, and now been affirmed in January in, by the Supreme Court decision on uh, corporate participation in elections that corporations are being afforded many of the rights that most human beings and 80% of Americans think should only uh, be rights of real living and breathing uh, humans. And so I think that ultimately uh, we do need clarification uh, in a constitutional uh, amendment to clarify that corporations, uh, what rights they do and don't have is different from, uh, this, uh, different from human beings and make that super clear. Um, <laughs> however, I, I feel very strongly that we cannot wait for that in order to to free our democracy from the grip of corporate control. And so therefore, I would urge us um, to all support um, Representative Markey and others who are, are pushing for legislation that we require any corporation that contributes to an election campaign to get a vote of its shareholders beforehand uh, and that it be totally transparent. And I think if we can move that along, that we could, that's much easier to do than any kind of constitutional convention or constitutional amendment. Um, and, um, and if we can move that along, um, that, and because there is such outrage, 80%, as I say, of Americans uh, object to the Supreme Court decision in January that unleashed corporate spending in elections. And I think that most corporations would be very uh, wary of um, asking for a vote of shareholders on a political candidate because that would, they want us to buy their products and invest in them and I think that would be a very risky proposition. So I think there are things we can do right now to seriously blunt the impact of that decision and we must. Um, and um, so I really appreciate both of those important questions. Thank you. 
Okay. And there's one other point. Could you tell people that if they can't get to the mic or choose not to, we'll bring them one? Okay. And so two points, I'm gonna go back and forth between these two mics, and then there is a portable mic, so if someone chooses not to stand up or is unable to stand up, uh, the mic can be taken to you. So uh, I'll go back to the back then. Okay, thank you. Um, I see it as we're getting better and worse at the same time, but which makes it very confusing. But you mentioned about secrecy. I think a bigger problem than secrecy is most of what's going on is publicly known, but we are in denial because it's scary and it's fearful. And that denial, you know, the F word, how many, how much fascism does it we have to get before we admit that that's where it is? And you want to talk about vision, I'll just point one thing out. Um, we once had a president who called off the arms race and the space race and said we should redirect military resources for the public good of the planet. And he was removed from office in a military coup two months later. And that's why our politics is broken. And the Democrats are afraid to talk about this. And most of our society is afraid to talk about this. And that's the ugly cancer that's at the root of why politics doesn't work. You know, I'm not disappointed that Obama's putting more Monsanto people in at the FDA. He's funded by Wall Street. The question is the deeper paradigm of denial that, you know, the question's implicit. <laughs> well, is the, the question, I, I, I got the question, is, isn't the deeper paradigm here denial? And I, I'm in, I, I basically, I agree that, that fear, that fear is the spiral of powerlessness creates a culture of fear. And I probably should have stressed that even more in my talk because I think that, and you'll see in my, in getting a grip where that I talk about the spiral of fear that k keeps us in denial. And so I very, very much agree that fear and denial is, is, is deep in us. But I think that we don't come out of denial by being, by being talked at and being uh, accused of anything. That's just not a pathway to freeing ourselves from denial. And so I think that the more that we each can share you know, remember we are all teachers. If the mirror neurons thing is, is true, that as I'm doing this, there are parts of your brain that are doing this. Everybody who's watching us is learning from us. And so as we step out and show a way, walking with our fear, coming out of our denial because we learn that we can walk with fear, other people see that. And I see it as I was talking to students today, so many of them so doing such creative things for environmental sustainability on their campus, on this campus. And so I think that is the way to get us out of denial, is to show us, show it through our actions, show others and convince ourselves there is another way. Uh, that is, I think, believing is uh, seeing and we have, people have to believe there is another way. And so that is, uh, living it ourselves and telling these stories of possibility, I think it's key to help us get beyond our denial. So thank you very much for that. And now up here. Hi, Frankie, it's Bud. Um, welcome to Eugene. Thank you. Um, you, on this question of population, you had mentioned in your presentation, Carola, and that's a really powerful uh, example of uh, how important it is to address the population population problem by empowering women and educating them, giving them economic opportunities. So maybe you want to talk about that sometime too. But my question of you is this. I'm looking for uh, some rays of hope from you on the question of uh, global terrorism, uh, religious fundamentalism, uh, international chauvinism, all those things that are basically constructed into politics of fear that operate around the globe now, and it's, it's no less in, in America than elsewhere. Um, what can we, what can you offer us in terms of dealing with that creatively, productively, differently than militarily? Where is there hope in resolving this global issue? <laughs> well, um, I, in, in getting a grip, 
uh, I don't devote a lot of my attention to this as a separate issue. I rather weave it into one of the symptoms of a mindset that has created a social, economic, and political structure that is so malaligned with our nature that it does not give us meaning, and in fact it violates our need for meaning, and it is so demeaning that it is no surprise I don't think many of you are too. I mean, I would imagine you share this feeling that it is, it is not surprising that people then find meaning through the most horrific ways of lashing out and destroying because as we know, if people cannot create, we have to, as Eric Fromm has put it, you know, that we are creatures who must make a dent. We, we are doers and if we can't do in a creative way, we will do by destruction. And so I really don't see any shortcut to the dealing with, uh, to dissolving the roots of terrorism short of the kinds of things we're talking more generally about tonight, which is shifting the frame from this notion of a one rule, from a notion of scarcity that then leads to the sense of disempowerment, that leads to a one rule economy that concentrates wealth so much that the people who could all fit into this room here control as much wealth as half the world's population. And that creates such a sense of hopelessness and sense of de being demeaned that terrorism will just keep ex escalating until we go to that route. So I, I don't think it's a separate issue. Uh, that's my personal view. It is interwoven in everything we're talking about. And it's evidence, maybe the ultimate evidence of how malaligned with our nature is a social structure that we with, that we're living within right now. Thank you. And in the back? Uh, yes, you mentioned a country that through its own process decided not to use GMO cotton. Yeah. Did you say Mali as the country in Africa or Bali in oh. Indonesia? Thank you. Maybe my Texas accent not pronouncing, Mali, as in the girl's name, Mali. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, the truth is, I do not know, maybe somebody knows here, I saw, oh, I want to tell you, though, and as I answer that, uh, if any of you want a big lift, a uh, big positive lift, there is a set of DVDs you can order from the International Institute for Environment and Development that were created by illiterate Indian women in Andhra Pradesh in India, in, you know, uh, and uh, they include a film of this citizen's jury in Mali where fall small and far small and large farmers came together and, and made this choice and many other things about how these farmers in their community in Andhra Pradesh are standing up to Monsanto and creating genuine food security and returning to diversified farming and their own uh, food safety nets as well. So uh, I can show you, tell you, I think it'd be wonderful to have, if, especially if any of you, uh, any, of course in here in the university, if any the rest of you are educators elsewhere, it's just a wonderful tool um, because it's all created by uh, illiterate Indian women and the very high production values and very powerful evidence of, of living democracy in agriculture. So the, another question? Where, it's the International Institute for Environment and Development. It's in the UK, and I believe this DVD series is called um, Affirming Life and Diversity. But if, if, if you have any trouble finding it, uh, uh, we can talk afterward. I meant, I, yeah, I, I know it's that organization. You try their website. It's Andhra Pradesh, it's a Deccan Plateau, it's a Deccan, D-E-C-C-A-N society that uh, is the group that is this rural women's group and uh, just, I'm very happy to help you find it. I'm sorry I don't have a better information on it, but um, that's where I watched the Mali farmers in the citizen jury. So uh, who's next? Okay. Hi, Ms. LePay, thank you for coming. My name is Sherry and uh, my sister would like for me to talk to you about food as if it was separate from politics, but since we know that isn't true, she's watching right now from um, Carson City, Nevada. So I'd like to talk about something else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's very related, actually. Um, she won't blame me, right? No, <laughs> she'll blame me and tell me later, I think. <laughs> 
Um, we both love your books, you know, especially the recipe. Um, I'm still making sesame rice fritters. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people who can't speak for themselves tonight in any way because they're in prison. And this brings me to, um, you know, the, the thought is, are you familiar with the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act? And that if there are people who are fighting for the planet, talk about your heart pounding, mine's pounding right now. Um, just, you know, people who are, have found ways to fight for the planet and for the inhabitants of the planet. And it's not necessarily, a, you know, a legal way to do it, but sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes people feel like that's the only way. And if it wasn't so powerful, why would the government have created the Animal Enterprise Terror Terrorist Act, Terrorism Act? And there are people here in Eugene who were thrown in prison. Um, are you familiar with the Communication Management Unit, CMU? Um, well, I'll just suggest that people uh, who aren't familiar with those things, look them up, the AETA and CMUs, and please respect the people who are using less orthodox tools in the toolbox. Thank you. Thank you. In the back. Yes, thank you. My name is Brittany, and I'm studying to be an elementary school teacher. My question for you is, um, in what ways do you think we can address and challenge our society's culture of overconsumption and materialism, especially among young people? Well, I, my hypothesis is that what we see as overconsumption is a symptom of a lack that comes from this premise that I described earlier, and that the premise that then leads to such concentration of corporate power that we are bombarded with this, it's a combination of being bombarded with advertising, telling us, telling us uh, that obviously, you know, what we need to be then playing on our insecurity, our need to be accepted, part of the tribe, and then playing on that to make us buy, 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 and offering so little other opportunity, so the venues for meaning and establishing our, our status in a group by who we are rather than what we buy. So. To me, I, I think in some ways consumerism is misdiagnosed as a cause. I think we'd be much better off to think of it as a symptom of this concentrating one rule economy that then leads to such a sense of internal uh, insecurity. And I think that for young people, and I'm particularly acutely aware of it right now with a three-year-old granddaughter and another eight-month-old granddaughter, but. Uh, and seeing you know, her bombarding, her um, being bombarded. Um, and I think that the only, um, the only antidote short of this longer term strategy of living democracy, I mean, I shouldn't say short of, as we create a living democracy, but as we do it to make the direct connection with all of the young people, for example, who were in Youth Build, the organization that I mentioned, uh, finding meaning through developing their own powers, their own skills, and their powers of being decision makers in this group. And so, and all of us reaching out to young people and, and helping them find a pathway of deeper meaning. I, I think that is, um, that there is no alternative to that, and helping them to find the, the courage to stand up to the pressure and, and really talking, talking about courage as a virtue that we can cultivate and, and, and encourage our children to, to recognize what it means to stand up against the pack, against bullying, for example. That is critical to standing up also to the pressure to buy in order to be accepted. So. I, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but um, it's, I think it is, it is the answer that we, this all touches all of us. And um, so thank you for that question. Yes, please. I'm Jerry Smith, a retired social worker here in Eugene. And um, my question is gonna focus on homelessness where I'm kind of an activist. Um, and what can we do in a state where the statistics show that we, Oregon is the lowest state 
in the union in terms of homelessness per capita. We have the hungriest children per capita. We have... Um, you mean lowest state? We, we're at the bottom. of. Uh, we, then there's no, no... Maybe Alabama, they made the you, with us to be a state that has more homeless people per capita. Uh-huh. It's, it's not widely known, but the statistics are very strongly there that that's true. We have um, a, a lot of unaccompanied homeless children. We have children with families that are homeless um, and a huge amount of single disabled adults who are, are homeless. Um, as groups, they're very hard to organize. Um, and that's my background is doing sort of a community organization, but we seem so slow to jump on this. And what ideas do you have that, that might benefit Oregon in terms of dealing with the huge problem they have with homelessness? I'm not sure I have any special expertise or examples that I can say, oh, look what they did there. Uh, but I do think that each of us, I mean, one of the things that is so striking to me that does relate to your question, and I think relates, therefore, solution, is that since John Edwards imploded, uh, no politician that I'm aware of, no national politicians, had the nerve to use the word poverty. Have you heard President Obama talking about poverty? I haven't. And so it's, it's somehow become taboo to acknowledge that poverty is increasing in America, as I noted, you know, that one half of our children are going to be living on food stamps at some point in their lives. So we can all, through our letters to the editors, through our whatever we're doing to communicate with anyone, to use the P word, you know, to talk about the fact that we are becoming a third world country uh, when we have this level of poverty, and it's increasing. And so to, to acknowledge, to, Denial, the word of the night, you know, that, that, the, that uh, I think we are in denial about poverty and as the, the, the horrible face of it in the form of, of homelessness, particularly for children. So I think something we can all do is to, is to break that silence and then look to what other communities are doing. And I wish I had a, a better answer for you than, than that. Uh, it's not the... It's not a, and I, I apologize that I don't, but, but thank you. Uh, I think that we can all be part of breaking that silence. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Nice. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so Ms. LaPay, Mrs. Sorry, Mrs. <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to the mic, I'm sorry. Um, it's anyway. Okay. Frankie, actually. <laughs> Frankie. Yeah. I aspire to be a 95-year-old Frankie. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> Good on you. Anyway, so... Sorry, I gotta get in my thoughts. Sorry, I'm dragging this out. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Um, with people like you, um, teaching people like me, teaching a new generation like me, the possibilities of change that we all really can believe in, do you believe there's a new sense of hope emerging in human society? Well, I believe <laughs> that all, all I know, I mean, this is my own personal daily struggle, all I know is that what's required of me, and, and I can't speak for anyone else, is that I just find, I just I can almost feel my heart like, stretching to get big enough to hold the deepening pain and the deepening sense of possibility. It's just like, ah, we've got to just hold it all and live in the not knowing. And that's really hard, especially when you see the faces now, if, if many of you can relate to this, of my grandchildren. And that's the hardest thing. And I don't know. But I know that it is the privilege to be alive in this moment when it's so clear, it's so clear. And all I know is I want to get braver. And I want to get braver with you. We get braver with each other. 
And I'll just end with one final little study that was done at the University of Virginia where they put, they put um, two groups of, of students at the foot of a hill. One group, they each had heavy backpacks. They were facing a hill and one group had a friend by their side and the other group was just standing, each one by themselves. And the group with a friend by their sides saw the hill as much less daunting, <laughs> steep, much less steep than the group standing by themselves. So all I know is that I don't know the answer to your question. I know we've got to stretch our hearts to hold it all in this unknown when it's so clear what we've got to do. And the way we do it is to have buddies, to reach out to people, to bring the people into your life who are braver than you are because you're going to become more like them. That's how we change. And to do things that you didn't think you could possibly do. And then the next thing you couldn't do. That's what the world needs of us right now, and you need more backbone. And I'm, I'm preaching to myself, I'm not preaching to you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot about the books. Yeah, yeah I wanted to get you down there.